Gracious Lord, Heavenly Father, thank you, God, so much for your love and your guidance. I ask you, Lord, to please give me the strength and also the wisdom and things that are not known, let it be known today, that we may have an understanding of your truth and your word and your love. In Jesus' name, amen. The topic today is called the rapture, because there is a rapture. Jesus is going to take us home. But there is another teaching called the secret rapture, that, some, that God is going to take, the, the, gonna take God's people as a, secretly, and then seven years he's going to come back and take the rest. I believe there is no such thing as a secret rapture. I believe that there is a rapture. Now, where did they get these teachings in the Bible? Well, the first scriptures they use, uh, one of the scriptures that they use is found in Matthew 24. And we read verse 40. It says, Then shall two be in the field, the one shall be taken, and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, and the one shall be taken, and the other left. Watch therefore, for you know not that what hour, remember, hour your Lord does come. And so in, in verse 43 it says, But know this, that if the good man of the house had known in, in, what, in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken. So in, in sense is that we don't know the hour when Jesus comes. And when he comes, one will be taken and the other one will be left. One will be taken and the other one be, will be left. It's like a person robbing your house, as the Bible describes. You don't see a man sitting outside knowing the time when the robber is going to come. You don't see a robber calling the house saying, hey, Willie, you know what? Say about midnight. Yeah, I'll come about midnight and rob your house. It's, it's, a, it's not going to happen. But it's talking about the hour of, of his coming. In Matthew 24, 44, it says, Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as he think not the Son of Man cometh. So it's talking about a time. Now, 2 Peter 3.10 is one of the main verses they use. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. So we will know when Jesus comes. It's going to come unexpectedly. That's why it's going one will be taken, the other one will be left behind. It's good to read the whole verse. So let's read the whole verse. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, the earth also and the works that therein shall be burned up. My brothers and sisters, when Jesus comes, it's going to be a great noise. Everybody will know that he was coming. So when he said he's coming, he's coming everybody will know it's going to be a great noise. But the Bible, what the Bible is referring to, what they're referring to, the, we don't know the hour or the day that he's coming. We don't know the time that he's coming. But when he does come, we will know. Amen. So I want to go through the parable of the sower because it brings more light to about this theory that it's dangerous. It is dangerous to believe in this theory about the secret rapture. Now let's go to Matthew 13. I hope you brought your thinking caps on and your books and pen because this topic here is a study topic. In Matthew 13 verse 24 it says, Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, the kingdom, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man which soweth good seed in his field. It's like unto a man that soweth good seeds to his field. So if we think about the kingdom of heaven, we have to, it's, it's like, a man that sows good seed in the field. Verse 25. But, what, but while man slept, his enemy came and sowed, good, sowed tears among the wheat and went his way. Verse 26. And when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tears also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seeds in thy field? From whence then have its tears? He said unto them, An enemy has done this. The servant said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tears, you root us, you root up also the wheat with him. <laughs> Here is the wheat and the tares. They, they almost look alike, but one is to destroy and the other one is to be fruitful. The wheat, oh man, the wheat and the tear had to be together. The, the, the servant says, let's root out the tares. And the farmer said, the sower said, no, 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 no. We can't do that because if we root out the tares, we will also root out the wheat. 
Now, what does this parable mean? It's, it's, and I thank God that he actually explained the symbolisms of this parable. The disciples came up to him and goes, Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field, according to verse 36. And he says, okay, I will tell you. And verse 37 tells us that the sower represents the son of man. And verse 38 tells us that the field represents the world. The good seeds represents the children of the kingdom. And the tares represents the children of the wicked one. And verse 39 tells us enemy is the devil. And harvest is the end of the world. And the reapers are the angels. You know, it's amazing. It's kind of, it's, it's crazy to how they use the word reapers to represent, how he used the word reapers as angels. Okay, so I'm going to do a real recap here because it's very important to understand the symbolisms here. The sower is the son of the man, son of man. The field is the world. Good seeds are the children of the kingdom and the tares are the children of the wicked. So the wheat and the tares, God's kingdom, God's children and the wicked children had to grow together. Enemies. The enemy is the devil and the harvest. When everything is fruitful, you shall see the difference. And that's referred to the end of the world. And there you have the reapers or the angels. So verse 30, it says, gather ye together first the tares and bind them in the bundle to burn them up, to burn them. But gather the wheat into my barn. So he gathers the tares and he also gathers the wheat. But he takes the tares and, and burns them and he gathers the wheat. And where does he take them? He takes them to his barn. Okay. As therefore, verse 40, as therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. So the tares represents who? The children of the wicked one. And they will be burned in the fire at the end of this world. Amen. Okay. So real quick, real quick. The wicked, oh, no, no, wait, I'm jumping, I'm jumping. Let's, let's carry on. Okay, Matthew 13, 36. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but even, but my father only. Okay, he's, Jesus said this when he was on earth. Only God knew the day when he was coming. But I believe now Jesus knows when the second coming is here, coming. Matthew 13, 37. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Man. Oh, okay. Now we have a connection. I want you to hold that story that we shared about the sower of the seed. Because now we're going to use that connection of the sower of the seed with the connection of Noah. Why? Because now the Bible is saying that the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. There's something in the story of Noah that will help us to prepare ourselves for Jesus' coming. And verse 38, for as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. They were, they were getting drunk. They were partying. They were doing their own thing. They were, they were, they were, women was being with men, women. Man was being with man. There was a lot of things that were happening in the time of Noah before the flood. This is how we know the time of our time when Jesus is coming. We look at the time of Noah, what happened then. So let's go back. To, let's go to that story in Genesis chapter 7. And we read verse 23. What happened at the time of the flood? Every living substance was destroyed which was upon the face of the ground, both man and cattle and the creeping things, and the fowl of the heavens, and they were, de and they were destroyed from the earth. And Noah only remained alive, and they that were with them in the ark. You see how the word alive is italicized? It's because in the original language, the Hebrew language, it's not actually there. But they place it there to make it, to have more sense into the verse. But let's remove it because not, it's, not, it's not actually there in the, original, in the original scriptures. So, and they, and the fowl of the heaven, and they were destroyed from the, from the earth. And Noah only remained. And, the, and they that were with them in the ark. So Noah and his family remained. They stayed. Now let's read, remember Matthew 24 verse 39. It says, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. Took who all away? The people that were outside the ark. The ones that did not enter into the ark. They were taken away. Oh, my brothers and sisters, you do not want to be taken away first. Remember the tares and the wheat? 
the tares were taken away first and they were burned. So the secret rapture, if, they, if you believe in a secret rapture about one will be taken away first and the other one will be left away, you do not want to be taken first. But my brothers, my brothers and sisters, the, when the wheat, when the tares are taken away first, so also the, the, the God's wheat, God's people will be taken in the, uh, to heaven. It's the same event. But the time is unknown to mankind. Now let's look at Luke 27. The, I tell you in that night where shall be two men and one bed, two men and one bed, the one shall be taken and the other shall be left. Two women shall be grinding together. The one shall be taken and the other left. Two men shall be in the field. The one shall be taken and the other left. Now watch this. The very next verse, it says, And they answered and said unto him, Where, Lord? Where are you taking them? And it's not saying, Where are you left? It says, Where are you taking them? And he said unto them, Wheresoever the body is, the body is, thither will the eagles be gathered together. The only reason why it's referred to a language of the eagles gathering together is because they're eating dead corpse. My brothers and sisters, you do not want to be taken first. Let both grow together until the harvest. Let the tares and the wheat, let God's people and the, and, and the children of the wicked one be growing together in the time of the harvest. In Matthew 13, 44, it says, But I say unto you, I love this verse, but I say unto you, love your enemies. Amen. The, word, the definition of enemies are those who are hostile towards you. Amen. Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Oh, can I preach this a little bit? What I know a lot of us are going, has been through a situation when people just use you. People backstab you. How many of us have people hated us? And now it's hard. See, <clears throat> I can forgive my brothers and sisters, but if I don't have a love to uh, someone, it's easy for me to, to hate them. This is how we, how humanity thinks. We, we can, if you do something wrong to my family, I'm going to get you back. According to the Bible, we say we should love our enemies. Anyone that is hostile against you, bless them that curse you. Amen. Do good to them that hate you and pray for them which despitefully use you. Just pray for them because at the end of the day, the battle is not yours. It is God's and he will take over. All we have to do is to stand our ground. This is how we fight, is to stand our ground. And verse 45, verse 45, it says, That ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven, for ye make it his Son to rise on the evil and on the good, <coughs> and send of rain on the just and on the unjust. When I read this, this verse, I was like, God, what are you doing? Because what, he, what, what I just read right now, he's saying, My God, my Father... Well, his son is to rise on the evil and on the good. He will send rain to the just and the unjust. So even though I'm with God, God is going to send sun to the ones that has hostile, that, that's hostile against you. He's going to send rain to the, to the evil, to the unjust. This is the type of God that we serve. See, we were like saying, oh, we don't need this evilness, and we don't. But the only reason why God is allowing these evil, the, the evil things that are happening, and these people that are hurting us and backbiting us, is because these people can do things that people that you love can't. <laughs> oh. Because these, we need our enemies. In fact, in Psalms 23, he says, if, Psalms 23 tells us that if anyone wants to feed us, if you want God to prepare a table before you, you need your enemies to be in the presence. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. So when, when you have enemies in your circle, God will always be with you. Even though he's sending sun and rain to the unjust and, and the evil, he's on your side because the one thing that the evil people can, the unjust don't have is God feeding you. Oh, amen. So we have this. And God knows that if he removes his son, he won't just kill the people, the unjust. He's going to destroy the just. So he allowed the wheat and the tear to grow together. And when the harvest comes, you shall know them by their fruits. 
my brothers and sisters, there is no such thing as a secret rapture. But there is a rapture, and Jesus is going to take us home. And he tells us how he's coming. In fact, in 2 Peter 3, verse 11, it says, Which also said, Ye man of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner. So my brothers and sisters, the, they saw Jesus go up to heaven. He goes, the way you see me go up is the way you're going to see me come down. But I'm coming with manna. Amen. So my brothers and sisters, Jesus' second coming is a literal event. It's a literal event. In Luke 24, 38, he says, and he said unto them, why are you troubled? And why do thoughts arise in your heart? Behold, my hands and my feet, that, is, that it is I myself, handle me. And see, for I, a spirit have not flesh and bones as ye see me have. Let me say this again. This is after he resurrected. And when he resurrected, he said, look at my hands. I'm not a spirit. <laughs> you know how we, a lot of us believe when we die, we, we are spirit. He says, no, 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 look, I'm not a spirit. Look at my hands. I, I, I'm flesh and bone as you see me have. My brothers and sisters, the, it's a literal event. Revelations 1 verse 7, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierce him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. People will see Jesus come, my brother and sister. It's a loud event. It's a huge event. It says every eye shall see him. How in the world can we all see him if he's coming from the east side of the world? How, how is it possible when the earth is round? Until I, looked, until I looked at the Greek word for the every eye shall see him, every eye, it's meaning that everyone will know that this is the day the Lord has come. Amen. It is a physical event, my brothers and sisters. It's a literal event. It's a physical event. And it's also a glorious event. In 31 it says, And ye shall send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, and from one end of the heaven to the other. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. This is a huge event. It's a literal event. It's a physical event. And my brothers, it's a glorious event. In Revelation 6 verse 14 it says, and the heaven departed as a scroll when it, as, as a scroll when it, it rolled together and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. This is a big event, my brothers and sisters. Jesus Christ's second coming, he's going to let every, everyone know that he's here to take you home. But the question is, how close is his coming? God has given us signs so many signs. And he's coming, according to Matthew 16, 27, he is coming with glory and with his angels. In Revelation 5, verse 11, it says, Behold, I heard the voice of many angels round about him, throne of the beasts, the, uh, about the throne, and the, the beast and the elders, and the numbers of them was 10,000 times 10,000 times 10,000 of thousands. This is how much power you have, how much army. You have an army that's beside you. You just have to believe that he is coming for you. But he's not coming alone. This is an event that he's been dying to come. He's dying to take us home. Time is coming. And if you're not prepared now, I guarantee you won't be prepared then. In Revelation 22, verse 11, it says, He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He that which is filthy, let him be filthy still. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. In another sense, my brothers and sisters, there's going to be a time when God says, who, uh, there's going to be a time when God cannot answer your prayers. And there's going to be a time when he's going to say, if you're unjust, then you're unjust. The time is up. I'm not trying to scare you trying to prepare us because he is coming and Matthew 24 3 tells us gives us a sneak sign of how close we are the season of, uh, of his coming and as he sat upon Mount Olive the disciples came unto him privately saying tell us when shall these things be and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world but thou Daniel in Daniel 12 
Verse 4 gives us a sneak preview of, of signs to watch out. But thou, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book. Even to the time of the end, many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall increase. And that's exactly what we see now. We have planes that actually take us to and fro from one country to another country. And this was, was prophesied thousands of years ago, a thousand years ago, hundreds of years ago. We have prophesied from one country to another country. And this was prophesied in Daniel. And he said knowledge will increase. And we have 5G towers all over the place. This is one of the highest technologies that we have. And the radiation that it takes out is the same radiation of a microwave. And it's all over New Zealand. These are the areas where it's in New Zealand. Auckland. And now in the knowledge that has increased, it's amazing uh, technology they have. Now that Apple and Google has launched a new app for iOS and Android to track down whoever had a COVID-19 coronavirus, whoever had the virus, they will have their phone and their name and their information, and they, it will be traced, they'll be tracked. They will know where you're at. If I had the coronavirus and you have the app and, the, and I had the phone and my information, I will be tracked by the app to let other people know that I was one of the ones that had the coronavirus. Amazing technology. In Matthew 24 verse 4 it says, And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. We should not be deceived. The only way you can deceive me if you, if you come to me as though you are God. Matthew 25 verse, 24 verse 5 says, For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And that's exactly what happened. For hundreds of years now, people are pretending, portraying to be the Messiah. One of the Messiahs in America say his name is Jose, yes, Jose Luis. His quote, he quotes saying that he is Jesus Christ in the flesh and that he will never die. And then in August 8, 2013, he died. So many people are claiming to be the Messiah, but there are false lies. There are liars, my brothers. They are not the true Messiah. Australia, you have a false Messiah. His name is Alan. And Alan Miller has a wife named Mary. Oh, sorry, not this Mary. This is the other Mary. <laughs> because he divorced and now he has another woman and now she's the other Mary. It's amazing. It's, it's, it's sad, my brothers. It's sad that people are actually believing because we have thousands upon thousands of people following these false teachings. You should don't ever just believe everything you hear. This is why I'm sharing with you. Listen to me. Don't just believe everything that I'm saying, but go and research everything that you're hearing. Take one evidence. Take another opinion. Go research, not just YouTube. Google everything. Ask around. See what they have to say. And gather all that information and find out what you believe in. Because my, my belief might be a different belief to you. But what I'm, stating, what I'm stating to you is what I truly believe is coming straight from the Bible. But I want you to do the same because that's how your faith grow. Your faith cannot grow with inside, inside a minister. Oh, man. People should not go to church because of a minister. People should not go to church because of somebody that did them wrong in church. You should never give that type of authority to a minister or to anybody to make a decision of your salvation. Your salvation is involved. If, you, if Jesus Christ comes and he asks you what happened and you say, because I didn't like this person, he goes, so you're going to say you don't want it to come to, to my wife because of that person when you know I died for you? Do not give that type of power and authority to any enemy, to anybody that's hostile against you, my brothers and sisters. Matthew 24, verse 6, it says, And you shall hear of wars and rumors of war. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. So the knowledge, we hear these wars. Right now there's a, there's a war with Turkey and Syria, and they're battling at the borders because Turkey wants to, wants to make a safe zone inside of Syria, between Turkey and Syria. And there's a lot of people, innocent people, are, are dying from airstrike and gunshots and tanks. Everything is happening and innocent people are in there. These are, these are signs, my brothers and sisters, that the end is near but not yet. 
also new pestilences, diseases, Ebola, Zika, all these viruses that come. The new one that came is the coronavirus, I believe. I believe, and a lot of other people believe that it's man-made, but some people believe that it's bats. If we look at the Wuhan market where it was actually started from the coronavirus, they said it started from here. And they said they got it from bats because they were selling bats. And bats are found thousands of miles away from the Wuhan market. But what you can't find near the Wuhan market is a laboratory that, that tests new viruses. Actually, there are two laboratories. So there, and these laboratories, is possible that the, the thing that they were studying on viruses actually probably leaked out. But if they're saying about bats, come on. They're thousands of miles away from the Wuhan market. Matthew 24, verse 7, an earthquake in diverse places, and there shall be famine. My brothers and sisters, all these are signs. The Bible says these are the beginning of sorrows. These are the beginning of birth pains. So when you see all these people are saying they're the Messiah, wars and diseases and, and dis natural disasters, all these are birth pains. When, you, when the woman feels a pain, then you know that's a sign that's near. These are signs, my brothers, that son, Jesus Christ is near. Matthew 24, verse 9. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And that's what's going to happen. In verse 10. Then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another. You have that within families. These are, you know, the time is near, is when families start going against family. Is when brothers and sisters start hating each other, and leaving everything because of one, one wrong decision. Run one disagreement. It's amazing. You can do so much good to somebody, but when you do one thing wrong, then the whole thing falls down. They forget everything. How many of us can remember all the good things more than the bad things that people have done to us? The end is near. Verse 12, and because iniquity shall abound and love of many shall wax cold. People will know about this lockdown and we see the signs. And people are trying to say it's not the sign of the Bible. Come on, my brothers and sisters, don't listen to that. It is a sign. But your life will still wax cold. Your mind and your heart will still wax cold towards God because the decisions we made in our life, we become numb. And I know why. I believe this is one of the main reasons why we're in this situation right now. It's because the teaching started by teaching everybody that there is no God. Let's look at history. In Charles Darwin, The Origin of Species, this book, they did a 100-year anniversary since 1959. What happened in 1959? In 1959, President Eisenhower asked Congress for $1 billion for the Department of Health Education and Welfare New American Education Fund, fund for the promotion and publication of new science of evolution. So they were given millions of dollars to start a new teaching in our schools. And then here's the indoctrin indoctrination and in evolution. Before 1961, there were only two to 3,000 words about evolution. Now there are over 33,000 words that teaches evolution in our schools. Look what happened when we start teaching our kids that there is no God. Look at the stats. There was an increased percentage of teen girls who have had premarital sex. There was an increase of sexually transmitted disease at the age of 10 to 14. There was an increase of birth rates for unwed girls at the age of 10 to 14 years. There's an increase of fatherless homes account for 53% of teen mothers, 63% of youth suicide, 71% of high school dropout, 85% of youth in prison, 90% of homeless and runaway children. There, are, there was an increase of unmarried couples living together. There was an increase of divorce rates. There was an increase of child abuse, my brothers and sisters. There was also an increase of violent crime offenses. And also, in America, the SAT scores that they, the students had to go for an exam, the SAT scores had a decrease because according to the, the, the news, the, the news the SATs had to get dumber for kids to get smarter. And this all started because they started to add evolution in the teaching. They started to add that there is no God. Teen suicide rates increased since 1963. And this is an increase still going on. Suicide, suicidal is a serious thing. Not just, 
Like, it, you, people think if you're a Christian, you're fine, you're not suicidal. Just because we know the truth doesn't mean we will, we will go our own way. There are a lot of people that know the truth and still, try, still thinking of committing suicide. There are a lot of people that are still Christians and did commit suicide. Young kids, I've seen an eight-year-old hang himself. This is serious. In fact, it's not just the young ones. A Riverside pastor who reached out to people coping with depression and suicidal thoughts has taken his own life. 30-year-old Jared Wilson was a founder of the outreach group Anthem of Hope. Uh, but being a part of being human. And so I recognize that I am speaking to all of that, and I do ask that you would extend me grace as I step into such complexity and such tension. It seems like in an epidemic, there was Jim Howard of the 6,000 member real life church back in the beginning of the year on January 23rd. These are the new ones that actually committed suicide. Pastors who looked after 6,000 members, he had 6,000 members in his church who committed suicide. Pastors who are talking about suicide commit suicide. Because depression is a serious matter. It's, oh man. We got to take this serious, my brothers and sisters. And a lot of Christians, you're probably like, well, how can they commit suicide when they know the truth? You can know the truth. You can know the book, the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. But if you can't find Jesus in the Bible, then you will always fall into depression. I thank God that he helped me through my mess. You know, it is true, time does heal. But if it wasn't for God, I would have been, I don't know where I would have been, probably six feet deep underground. If time doesn't heal, God will. You need to find Jesus in this word. You need to find Jesus in your experience. These people found Jesus in their experience, I believe, but you also need to find Jesus in his word. It is so good to study who you love. This makes sense. What, and Moses got it down packed when God told Moses in Exodus chapter 8. He says, and Lord spake unto Moses, go unto Pharaoh and say unto him, thus saith the Lord, let my people go that they may serve me. Listen to what God said to Moses. He said, the only reason why I want you to let them go, because they're my people, but let them go so that they may serve me, not serve them. I'm not going to free you from your slavery so that you can be enslaved with yourself. No, 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 no. The only way to make you alive is to free you from slavery that you may serve me, my brothers and sisters. The reason why we're in this mess, too, is because we start because this government is teaching everybody of that there is no God. Our kids are going to church, uh, going to school six days a week. Six days a week. A lot of schools are starting from Monday to Saturday. And they're learning about evolution. And one day out of the week, they're learning about God. And we expect them to do right in church. When we're not teaching them during the week. See, church is meant to be a place where you walk in and go, yes. Hallelujah. Praise God. I'm at church to give God the praise because he wants me to come to church. It's the whole reason why he developed and, and organized the, the, the church because it was his idea. It wasn't man's idea. It was his idea. But during the week, we're stressing out on this. We're doing this. We're doing that. And then we come to church. We feel all slouchy. We get all depressed. Oh, we have to get up and go to church. No, church is something to be excited about. But the only way to be excited of church is when, you, when you're excited during the week to go to church. And we expect our kids to do right in church when they're actually doing wrong during the week. My brothers and sisters, here's hope. In verse 13 it says, but he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Praise God. Knowing this first, that there shall be in the last days scoffers walking after their own flesh. People are just going to do what they love, what they lust. They're going to lust the social media, Instagram, TikTok, uh, Facebook. You know, there's nothing wrong with the social media. It's how you use it for your own matter. How many of us are used? How many of us go to church, praise God, and visitors will come? But they're, they're confused because they see you holy, holy in church, but they see a whole different person on TikTok, on Instagram, on Facebook. 
What image are you portraying as a sanctuary of God? Jesus Christ, a savior or a judge? Which one do you want him to be when he comes? Do you want him to be your savior or your judge? He didn't die for no reason. He's coming. And you got to believe now before it's too late. He, he never left you. We left him by choosing self over him, by choosing job over him, by choosing love of others over him. He died for you. And time is running out. Your time is running out. Sooner or later, there's going to be a place where we have to wait for him. If we're not alive, we'll be here. Either he'll be a savior or a judge. But you got to believe in yourself. You got to believe in God that he can help you. He can help you. I've seen so many people online when I was doing my research for this topic. And then I drifted away and I started to see things that I wish I never saw. Family being burnt. An eight-year-old. We got to start finding something in this life. We got to find a purpose. Those are going through depressions and anxiety attacks uh, because of depressions and mental illness. Those are going through suicidal. I've seen the stats. These, these are not the updated stats. They're rising. And you got to find a purpose in this life with God. You got to be the dreamer that can dream things that's not, not yet to come. See, to dream or not to dream. To be or not to be. See, all too often the issue is, of fa is not failing to see the meaning and purpose around you. It's failing to see the dream inside the person the mirror is reflecting. See, I can accept dream and in, in another person, someone else. But it's hard to accept the dream inside myself. I mean, I, see, I can see blessings and purpose in churches and buildings and trees. But what does that all mean if, it, if I can't see it in me? I mean, I believe in the cause, but I'm struggling to see the cause in me. This is how I used to believe when I, when I went to church and didn't have a conversation every day with God. But now that I have a conversation with God, I can feel his touch. This is why seven-day cleansing means so much. Because it opens my mind and my heart to what truly matters in this life. And when you start finding that foundation with Jesus Christ, you can stand and say, I have a dream. I have a dream. And you will start untying the knot that came before the word to be. You missed it. You will start untying the knot that came before the word to be. You will start untying the N-O-T that came before the word to be. So don't dream to be someone. Dream because you are someone. Your dream doesn't give you significance. Rather, you give significance to your dream. Oh, hallelujah. So remove the titles and the labels and realize that you are able to connect and to link. Because labels are fables. They're only stickers and ink. It is up to you whether you choose to dream or not to dream. But for me, in my house, I know my dream affects others, not just me. So when you start to dream, it will open, it will open the room for other dreamers to remove their limits. No one, has, no one has ever built skyscrapers just for one person to visit. The sky is the limit because God has given us the greatest promise through Abraham. So stop waiting for followers. This is not Instagram. You are a dreamer and dreamers do not wait for an audience. They create one. That means we can't lose because we create one. To dream or not to dream, that is the question. In fact, to dream is my suggestion. But to put your dream into existence, that is God's objective. God was never against you. He was always with you. So why are we against them? Every time we choose self, self makes war to God because it's not with God. 
we have to connect. I know, I know it's hard. <laughs> Believe me, it's tough. You've seen these pastors that committed suicide because pastors go through a lot of, they don't just have to worry about their families, they have to worry about families. And it's tough to be you. I don't know where you're at in your relationship with God, but there's one thing I can know for sure. If you can feel me right now, I know that you really want him in your life, but there's so much going on in your life that this devil's got a strong hold of us. He makes us feel that we are the weak one. He makes us feel that we are unworthy. And the devil's so smart, but he is a liar because he knows that the only person that can uplift yourself is yourself. He knows the only one that can get you out of your mess is you. All you have to say, it's my decision because God made me in the image of him. He gave me this power and authority upon you, Satan. I am not a dog anymore. I'm not a weak link. I'm not a servant to you. I'm a servant to my God. And God said, I can overcome you. You are a scorpion that I can stamp on. The only one that's stopping us, the only one that's being you those who are having a picture thought of holding a rope around their neck those that are having a picture thought of their clothes being packed in a suitcase to walk out of their family those who know God but yet still do the same thing that God said don't. So I want, before I close, I want you to take this in your heart. Every time we know, because we know what is right or wrong, every time we pick up a cigarette, every time we pick up a drink, every time we start thinking hateful things towards someone else, God is standing right there next to you. And he's saying, why are you wasting your energy on things that are hurting you? Save your energy on the bigger matters. Save your energy on the purpose that I've given to you. I gave you a purpose and that purpose is for you to live and make a difference before it's too late. God is coming. The rapture it's just around the corner. Gracious Lord, Heavenly Father, thank you, God, for your love. Forgive me, Father, for the sins that I have done, for I have come short of your glory. I've come short of your peace, and I've come short of your love. But I ask you, Lord, that gap where I'm missing with our relationship, I ask you, Father, to please fulfill it. If everyone that, if it, for my brothers and sisters that are with me on this, this feeling of having this emptiness between, our, between us and God, I ask you, Lord, to fulfill that emptiness that we need so that the connection can come back together, so that we can reconnect with you. Because I'm tired, Lord. I want to go home. And I know my brothers and sisters do too. In Jesus' name. Amen.